Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. I have one of the most uh, important, cool, and successful producers in Nashville that flies under the radar. He's like so, so good that, uh, only a certain, <laughs> he's only available for certain people. And we're lucky that he took the time to come on the show. We're with David Kalmuski. Um, he's a multi-platinum Nashville based record producer. He's also a guitar player, multi-instrumentalist, engineer, mixer, songwriter. He's noted for his work in the studio with journey. Sean Mendez, Keith Urban, Megan Trainer, Justin Bieber, John Oates, Tennille Towns, The Sisterhood, Vince Gill, and loads of other people, loads of other artists. He's recorded, mixed, produced, played guitar, and mastered music for each of these artists. He's currently operating out of Addiction Sound Studios in Nashville, which he actually helped design and build with Chris Houston, who is the engineer for Led Zeppelin, The Who, War, and The Animals. Man, you went right if you need help, that's probably a good guy to talk to, right? Chris is really <laughs> the best in the world. He really is. <laughs> that's amazing. And uh, the studio is owned by Jonathan Kane, of course, from The Babies, Bad English, and Journey. His private production and mixing room has been featured in publications such as Pro Sound News, Billboard Magazine, GrammyPro.com, and other high-end audio manufacturers such as FabFilter, MicTech, and Metric Halo. David, I really appreciate your time, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, your dad was Kenny Kalmuski, who was a really great bass player. And as I read, one of the original band members of the Hawks with Levon Helm, uh, Richard Manuel and John Till back in 58. And he was also a really successful session player who went on to make records at Bearsville Studio, which for if you don't know, Bearsville is up in Woodstock, New York. And it's Todd Rundgren's primary uh, studio. He owns that studio, doesn't he? Well, Bearsville doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, I, I saw some pictures recently. A friend of mine drove by there and, and there's like hoarders. There were hoarders living there and, and washing machines and, and appliances wow. out on the lawn. But Todd Rundgren definitely, it was owned by Albert Grossman who managed Bob Dylan and the Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin and, and the band. And uh, in, the place was basically wired up and designed by by Todd Rundgren when he was you know, just coming out of the NAS as a teenager, he produced some of his very first records. Uh, my dad played on the first record Todd ever produced, uh, which was a great speckled bird record. Um, and Todd ran, you know, he was ahead of his time. He ran camera lines into every room and had microphones and, and stuff wired all around that complex. But, you know, years later, uh, the Rolling Stones would rehearse there and, and you know, Bob Claremont would have a mix room there. And it, it just became a really famous piece of rock and roll history. And, you know, my father was there at the very beginnings of all, literally like, you know, as they were building that complex, um, you know, in and working with Todd when Albert first was, you know, building Bearsville. Man, that's so cool. You know, that's one of the downsides of like, you know, looking at the back of albums that you can't do that anymore. Cause I, you know, you get so much, I got so much of an education doing that. And to the point where I, before I moved out of Florida, I think this has got to be like 89, before I moved out of New York, New York City and to Florida, we, I drove up to Bear, I drove up to Woodstock just to see the community. And I, and I went out of my way to drive to Bearsville, which is kind of, if I remember hidden, mm -hmm. it, it was off the beaten track, but it was so iconic that. And I was such a music nerd that I just wanted to go see Bearsville. Now, like, you don't know where anything's made because there's no album cover. No, I know. And we're kind of trying to fight for that. I, it's interesting. I literally just handed in a record to a very, very notable label. And management 
typically, as we've done for years, had uh, circulated label copy to collect all of the musician credits and the producer credits and the engineer credits and the studio credits and the assistant credits and just stuff that, you know, um, that gets cataloged maybe on all music and a few other sites that give people their credibility in this music industry. And, and when we got label copy back, it had all been stripped back and they had actually deleted all of <laughs> even the producer credit, like no producer credit. Oh my God. And, and I, re I re replied to the artist and everybody saying not even a producer credit on this. And, and they were like, no, you know, they say, they said there was no room for this because they've created their own metadata forms because it hasn't been standardized in the industry yet. Whereas even Spotify now has allowed producer credit and some songwriting credits, but even the labels aren't following the updates and updating their things. So they're just as much at fault for truncating that data and not really fighting for these credits for musicians and, and moving it forward. And, and, you know, I mean, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, a bunch of songwriters got together and really, you know, fought the powers that be uh, against CSAC for, um, you know, some legislation that almost crippled, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of policies that were in play to protect them. And they won. And it was it was a, a really interesting thing that happened basically over, you know, maybe even less than a week on the Internet. Um, and, you know, we're all just trying to, you know, we're having internal conversations of how does the music community of musicians and, and producers and and record makers really band together with their lawyers and their people in production agreements. You know, our production agreements used to really just specify, uh, you know, um, you know, things like splits and, and, uh, and ownership of masters. But I really think that we all have to get strong armed on, on, um, forcing accreditation of, uh, of ourselves and our crew and, and, and our team all the way through and, uh, and making sure that they end up wherever those credits become available. Um, yeah, you know, man. for that, for that reason alone, it's like, we're making important music here and there's a lot more than just an artist's name on a record. It's, it, it really is. Um, it's, it's important that we're able to follow musicians. I grew up, you know, I'd listen to a sting record and, and I'd want to know who played drums on it and, and like who's making five, four feel like four, four. And sure enough, it's Vinnie Caliuta, you know, and, and I can find that out very quickly and easily, but like, I would have no idea now on on how to even go deep and become a real music fan that's terrible yeah because that's in a sense every every bit of every back cover like that's a, a somewhat of a resume for everybody for the next guy for the next producer that's sitting there and saying wow i really like how this was done or the next artist and then you know who produced that well oh, it's not David just a resume it's a fan base it's like you know session guitar players and people who do really great work um now, even when a music fan goes, man, I love the guitar part on that whatever song uh, up until now, they could find out who that was. And maybe they could go dis discover and explore some other things they played on. It's how you could get into Albert Lee back in the day as a session players, figure out what records he played on or even, you know, in Nashville, of course, Brent Mason and a lot of guys that played on a ton of records. Absolutely. Man, you know, it would take you no time to find. 15 other records that they played on and actually become a fan of an individual musician uh, aside from the artist. And, th and that's, and that created a lot of musicians livelihoods. And, and I see that being taken from them as well too. It's not really just um, industry accreditation. It really is individual uh, fan bases. Yeah. And, and these guys have fan bases because I can't tell you how many session players I have interviewed and I get email. Thank you so much for interviewing Jeff King. Or That's whoever. Right. I love his playing. I've been a fan of his. And it was surprising to me. I was like, wow, these guys have. So everything you're saying is 100 percent accurate, man. Yeah. As a producer, you know, and as someone who moved to Nashville a little later in my career, I knew who all these guys were before I moved to town. I knew exactly who I wanted to hire on a record and I knew exactly who I wanted to play across the floor with. As a guitar player, I'd hire Tom Bukovac and I'd hire Pat Buchanan and I'd hire Jeff King and I'd hire J.T. Kornfloss and. Mm. Just, you know, all my favorite guys from all my favorite records. And they and they became my friends because I knew who they were when I got to town because their names were on the backs of records. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, 
I know we got a little bit off field, but I was curious because your dad did work with so many people. Like, let me just throw some names out there. He did work with Todd Rundgren. He worked with Cowboy Jack Clement, Jerry Reed, David Clayton Thomas from Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and loads of other people. What was the biggest lessons you learned from your dad about playing music, about the business of, of music, and maybe about life in general that related to your uh, development? Dad wasn't great at business, but man, he was a free spirit and he his joy of music uh, superseded uh, pretty much any other human being that I've ever met today. I've never, never met another person who, um, you know, my father would travel down to Florida. He was a bit of a snowbird every year and hated snow. And, and so he'd go live in Florida um, for most of the winters and find gigs and, and, ways to make music down there every year. But on his way, he'd go and and sit in on, on gospel churches and, and find them in the backwoods of wherever he was traveling and record the services. And, and I'd go to his home in, in Canada in the winter. Uh, I'm sorry, in the summer. And uh, he'd always be playing music, you know, always. He had a great, amazing record collection. And and he was always playing. He was always jamming. We always had guitars around the kitchen table. I mean, we, we'd get together for dinner, and w- there's very seldom would we actually have dinner without having guitars around the kitchen table, playing constantly uh, out of the joy and the love of making music. And that mesmerized me as a child. I, you know, and, and, and him passing that on to me, you know, some people might look from a looking glass and think it's obsession or I work too hard or this or that. But no, it's real joy and 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 listening. I mean, the be- the lesson I got from him was to not make, um, y- you know, music a, uh, y- you know, uh, to, to not make it an introspective thing, to really listen and collaborate and be fueled by the people ar- around you, you know. That's great, man. Yeah, I don't. Um, I think it's real healthy to do stuff like that. God, I mean, yeah, that's really a healthy, fun thing to do. It's so. I mean, uh, uh, who wouldn't have loved to sit and? Who, what music fan wouldn't love to sit and play guitar with their dad? And I've talked to a lot of guys, and that's one of their fondest memories of, of their entire lives is, is playing music with their dad. And I feel like you know, for a lot of people, music f- starts out as a very introverted thing, where you sit in your bedroom and you practice and you practice and you practice. And for me, I, I, it wasn't, you know, I mean, again, going back to the best thing he ever taught me is that it wasn't an introverted experience at all. It was really about being collaborative and listening and, and, and being afraid and vulnerable musically to, to just step on the edge of what you're able to do with, with another musician. And I still to date, you know, um, I'll have people or younger players coming up a, a, a lot of them want to know how I'll come up with an idea or how did you come up with that hook or that line or that guitar part's really unique. I'm not just playing a chart with, you know, just marking the changes or chords. Um, there might be odd voicings or there might be something that I'm doing that makes a guitar part unique. And they'll say, how did you come up with that? And I didn't, I didn't come up with, it. I listened and the room fed it to me. Sometimes you listen inside to what everybody else is playing and there it is. There's some, overtone and a harmonic of what two people are doing that are just just feeding you melodies you you're hearing inside what what's already there and so anyway i guess that's the best thing my father ever gave me is 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 my ears to listen inside of what's already in front of me great gift man i was curious how did you go from playing guitar to production and then all the other things you're doing behind the console and how long ago did this happen and over what period of time did it take? Um, for me, there wasn't a transition. It was always in tandem. Um, in my bedroom when I was six years old, had reel to reel tape recorders. I was doing sound on sound. I was doing overdubs. I was playing with microphones. I was messing around with tape effects. I was messing around with production ideas as I was learning guitar. Um, and so there was no divide. Um, as a teenager, I couldn't make money necessarily as a producer, but I took my band to a local recording studio uh, when I was 14 
and recorded some original music. And some of the band guys were like 18 or, or 19 years old. And, and the studio owner actually gave me kind of an engineering gig. And, and he talked my mother into driving me to the studio on the weekends so that I could actually work with other clients playing some guitar and engineering. And they went side by side, even to the point where I kind of left town when I was 16 and joined a road band and, and pulled a trailer around with PA systems. Um, we'd be playing in the clubs in the evenings, but during the daytime, while, you know, while the other band guys were either sleeping in or exploring the town, I always had a four track in my room. And, you know, I was using that while I was sort of paying my dues. Uh, I was always you know, messing around and feeling a little bit taken out of being able to jump into the studio. So when I'd come off the road, my house was always a studio, literally growing up with my father while we were still living with my dad, there was a studio in the back of our house. So I, I've never had a disconnect. I've always recorded the music I've created. I wasn't just a guitar player. I'd even learn how to play guitar by building rhythm tracks with drum machines and I put bass parts down and then I would make instrumental and uh, tra you know tracks and and basically improvise and solo and explore over over them as a guitar player. Wow. Okay. So this is something that was in your DNA for as long as playing guitar was basically. Yeah. Okay. So what prompted you then to move to Nashville and how did you get you know when you first came down to Nashville how did you get work and and how did it eventually lead to where you're at now. Well, you know, I came to Nashville by way of Stratford, Toronto, Kitchener, Vancouver. I moved, I, I re, you know, I started over a lot of times. Um, you know, I moved out west. I lived in Calgary for a while, lived in Edmonton, Canada for a while. Um, and every time I started over, you know, I had one thing that I, that brought me there. And, the one thing that brought me to Nashville was um, a, a recording career that I already had in Canada. And, you know, I had established myself as a producer. Um, I had records on the radio. I was uh, a, a regular uh, contender when when a major label, you know, Canadian band would be looking for a producer. Uh, I didn't realize even then how segregated the Canadian music industry was and how we weren't really getting, you know, recognition for a lot of these records worldwide. People would say, well, yeah, of course, you've got, you know, Brian Adams and, and you know, Avril Lavigne and, and Celine Dion and Shania Twain and Bieber and et cetera, et cetera. But those are actually American acts. You know, they they all broke from having U.S. record deals and management and lawyers and and, um, you know. I was working with a few artists that were curious enough about making some records in Nashville and LA that I, you know, luckily got, you know, taken in to those situations and figured it out very quickly that, um, there was a, you know, this, this whole other world. And by the time I landed in Nashville, I guess how I got work was I brought work with me. You know, I would bring tons of records with me. And I would hire, all, like I said, all the great guys I'd read on the back of albums. I'd, I'd bring a, you know, I'd actually have a budget from building from a 20 year career that I had built where people would trust me with their money to make a record. But instead of staying and doing what I had already done for 20 years, I started exploring and going to other markets and working a little bit in L.A. and working a little bit in Nashville. And instantly Nashville just won like it, it was um, more my speed. It was a small town uh, with so much music and world class studios. And, you know, honestly, as an awarded producer, engineer, guitarist, some of the interns were getting better drum sounds than me when I stepped into Nashville. It was yeah. you know, it was it was amazing. It was really, really great. It was humbling. And it was humbling to to really see how um, supportive the community was and, and people who I thought were maybe iconic and untouchable were, were actually really friendly and really um, supportive of the music and, and uh, that we made. So, man, I just every time I came to town to make a record, I just didn't want to leave. Yeah. And so I eventually stopped leaving, <laughs> you, yeah. know, I, you know, you uh, know, and I, I stopped needing to bring work with me because some of those friends would call me for other work, you know, some of that community. I knew some engineers that 
that would pass me work and some guitar players that would pass me work. And, you know, um, amidst all of the skill sets I had, it was really starting over. I mean, those the dues that I had paid and, and that career I had built that I had thought had established me was completely nameless and unknown. Um, interestingly enough, uncharted. I mean, a lot of the records that I had made uh, before 2005 are just kind of undocumented around the world. Other than in Canada, people, you know, kind of remember those records. But um, it it seems historically as though I got my start in 2005, but I was really, you know, recording in 1986. That's when you moved to Nashville, 2005. Um, that's when I started making records in okay. Nashville, yeah. and then I kind of, you know, still toured a lot. I traveled the world as a guitar player. I was really just trying to do everything, and 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 it was the grind, you know. It was really I was um, I worked very hard at at everything rather than focusing on on building sort of like a a, a musical foundation in Nashville. That came, uh, you know, after about five years of balancing everything by about. 2009, I had a permanent little studio in Nashville. All my return tickets were to Nashville. And, uh, you know, I had decided I wasn't, I wasn't leaving here. So let me ask you this. You, you just said you were working hard at everything. I've been in that situation, you know, numerous times because you got to hustle and, and, you know, you want to make hay while the sun shine and what, and it's, it's, often difficult or it has been for me anyway to know okay i need to let go of a b and c and focus on d only or d and e what was the trigger that allowed you to do that um like and have the confidence to do that and say okay i i'm i'm good i know this is going to happen uh, let's go back to the lesson of joy. You know, um, it's sort of like when work, when, when music becomes work and when it becomes work for hire and it becomes, um, stressful and overbearing and, and it, the rewards aren't the, the, the creativity. Uh, I'm really lucky. I had those lessons. I always, I've, I've never, really stayed in one place that I've been unhappy. If I was in a band and, and I just felt that I didn't love the music and, and, and it wasn't creatively like a part of who I was, I quit, you know, and I, and I've never really like chased the almighty dollar. And, and I, I guess for the first little while when I was working on everything and I was, and people saw that I was good at it, I got hired to play on a lot of demos and that was kind of my first mainstay in Nashville as a guitar player. I wasn't getting called to play on records, but I probably played on five, 600 demos in, oh, wow. in, you know, I don't know, four or five years. And, um, and I wasn't happy doing it. it. There was some really bad music and there was a lot of bad demos and it wasn't, I wasn't, you know, choosing the music. It was the work that was available to me. Sure. And so I quit. You know, I literally, I, you know, and, and, but I, we all needed to survive. So I trimmed it back. I, I, you know, I didn't just immediately quit. It was sort of like by the end of five years, I wasn't playing on demos anymore. And I was, um, recording music again that I was discovering that I was, you know, maybe even for less, I, I, you know, I was doing some pro bono work on with artists that I knew had the potential to, to really have a record on the radio and helped put a few of those artists on the radio. Um, and in the interim got paid for that in the end, but had to sacrifice the stability, I guess, and, and, and the guarantee of the, of the demo work. Um, and so I know I'm, I don't know if I'm, no, you're, you're right on you know, target, dude, on, no. on course uh, or anything, but it's sort of like, you know, I, it's the fine balance uh, between really chasing that joy because you can't always, always have that until you really get to a place where those dues have, have paid off. But you have to realize if you're just stuck in a rut and you're successful at that rut, you got to, you immediately have to recognize it and you have to make, you got to work harder to develop other opportunities for yourself. So I, even though I was really busy, and maybe I'd do, you know, two or three sessions in a day 
And at nine o'clock, I was really, really tired because I'd played on a ton of demos that day. I'd still get in the room and write a, write a song with an artist, you know, mm. or I'd, I'd take an opportunity to demo something for myself or I'd mix something for a friend that I know would probably end up making it on a record and, and, and get me more mix work, you know, that, yeah. that I enjoyed better than, uh, you know, than just hustling for, uh, you know, for the demo work. So I've, I've always shifted. I've always kind of like, um, you know, it's not, if, if it becomes work for hire and it becomes repetitive, uh, I'm not really that involved in it anymore. And so, you know, fast forward a decade of that and I'm sitting in a situation where I just don't get those calls anymore. Hmm. Um, people don't consider me for work for hire. If they need a utility provided to them, like, Hey, we need someone to record a few tracks for this or, um, you know, or, or, you know, do a bunch of demos. I'm not, I'm not even a, a consideration for that. Yeah. Cause you you're know? so far removed from it. Um, because yeah, I just, uh, it, it was sort of that, that experience and it was a slow evolution. It wasn't like overnight, like, okay, I'm going to quit everything and starve again. It was like, how do I develop other things that I, am excited about because at the end of the day i actually want to drive around in my car and listen to the music i'm working on <laughs> yeah. i missed that yeah. i really did yeah. i used to do that like even with those four tracks and stuff i'd sit in my room and i'd create stuff as a kid but the real fun was actually listening to it mm -hmm. you know and like listening back to it over and over again and and you know um and I do that now. I'm like a little kid, man. Like I'll work on something in the studio and, and man, if I don't want to get in my car and drive around and just experience the music I'm making, then I'm not doing it right. Yeah. Well, I think that's an important lesson, what you said about how you didn't stop hustling. You just started, hu stopped hustling in the areas that you didn't like and found or made or created opportunities in the areas you did like, and then those opportunities eventually panned out. And then you, you know, you just re changed the, the, where the, the cups were, you know, you poured more of the stuff into the cup that you'd like more. Yeah, so. that's right. It's a fine balancing yeah. act. I think that if people are too, uh, I, I also watch people who are like, um, unwilling to say yes to a bunch of stuff because they, they're too much on the, on the right side of what I just said, where they're like, no man, like that's, you know, uh, that's a detri detriment to my integrity. But what else are you doing? If you go work at Starbucks, that's more of a detriment to your integrity as well. Like if you do have a skill and you're up and coming and you're not quite there yet, you, you got to do the hustle. You got to do the grind. And you got to find ways to evolve yourself out of it. I watch a lot of people who kind of too early get too stubborn about their artistic ideas. And it's like, you know, and, and they'll, you know, say, you know, I don't want to sell out and do that. Well, I don't think I've ever sold out and I've managed to linearly uh, and steadily build. If you look at my life, it's it really is a ramp and it's been upward, you know, um, and it really is about saying yes to everything and always being a little bit in over your head to the point where every year it's just better work and better music and better friendships and better relationships and I'm not surrounded by a bunch of people who uh, are willing to discard me for something that's utilitarian that 50 other people could do. People wait for me now because they want to work for me with me for something. You know, yeah. they want my input or they want my creativity or they like how I play. And the, the dialogues now that I have because I've built that for myself is more like, hey, when are you available to do this thing with us rather than hey, we're doing this thing on Wednesday. Are you available? Yeah. <laughs> like, if I'm not, then there's a list of 15 other guys that they'll go down the list. Yeah, you know? yeah, I totally and, and get it. The thing, if, the, you know, if there's young listeners trying to figure out how to build individuality and success, that's something to just keep in mind. Keep busy, say yes to everything, be disposable, absolutely. But look for the people that you build a connection with and, and, and that really respect you for their creativity. And then do everything possible to make more music with them, even if there isn't a paycheck involved. Yeah, that's that's you got to be able to you got to be willing to work for free to some extent. It, well, for it's a, not for a little bit. 
Think about it like investment. I always say never yes. work for free either. I always put a price tag on your head because, you know, the, the, it's the most underappreciated work I've ever done in my life has been the free work. Absolutely. You, you, absolutely. You get what you pay for. And that's the perception of people. But if you're doing it with the right people and they know, recognize you're making an investment and they understand why and you're up front with it. Hey, I'd like to do this. I'd like to help you because I think, you know, we could work together in the future. You know, that's right. I yeah. mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's really good. I got to tell you, man, I want to tell the listeners. You're in like a studio. This is so good talking to even through Skype and it's like horrible rain here. The sound on your end that I'm hearing is like, oh my God, I can only imagine how good it sounds in that studio. It's just like, well, that's a shitty little Logitech video camera too. So (laughs) yeah, I mean, but I mean, it's just like, I could hear the quietness of, you know, the perfection of that, of that yeah, room that you're in there, man. It's awesome. It's definitely a, a room. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but you've been involved in so many cool projects. Would it be possible to like have a top three experiences uh, or, you know, the three that come to mind first, either because of your work, what you did and it felt rewarding or the people involved, the hang, anything. You know, I feel like if I answer that, I alienate the other 98 people out of 100 you know, <laughs> to a certain extent. I got to I got to say this is going to sound like a cop out, but you know, I get to I have made music with some of the most gifted people like my heroes and and people that I admire so much. I've gotten to travel the world and climb mountains. I've played stadiums and cafes. I've built studios and and my life is, and my musical life and my career, I wouldn't trade a second of any of it. And it's been so fantastic because of chasing that joy and that reward from the music itself that I'd say that that answer would be impossible for me because I, I, and this is going to sound like a cop out, but man, I am so excited about the track I have up right now that I'm about to jump in the room with the artist that's waiting patiently next door for me. I'm just as excited about that as I was playing a stadium or I was playing new music in a cafe or any record I've done like this on a daily basis. This doesn't this never gets lost on me. You know, Um, I I had a conversation with a very young drummer who's just so unbelievably talented and uh, and and she is taking, you know, Nashville by, by storm, but still very, um, you know, uh, overwhelmed by like how awesome this is. And, you know, we're in one of the greatest studios in the world. We're over at ocean way out on the tracking room, cutting with some of the greatest musicians in the world with a, 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 you know, a world renowned record producer. And I look across the room at her and there's just such the biggest smile and grin and just beaming joy out of her. And it just parallels with me at the same time. I would, I looked up because I was still after all these years of making music going today is amazing. I get to wake up today and be and do this that you know like create something that i want to drive around and listen to yeah that's so and most of the i'd say of virtually everybody that i have spoken with feels that is not lost on them either they you know they're very very humble and grateful to you know to experience what they're experiencing the same thing and i've learned a lot from talking with you guys about really focusing on that joy and whatever i'm doing more to be real candid with you so yeah um you're originally from canada Mm -hmm. where'd you grow up in canada i grew up in a little town called stratford ontario which uh before it was home of justin bieber it was home of Richard Manuel from the band and John Till from Janis Joplin's band and my father. Um, and before those gentlemen, my grandfather played saxophone for the uh, Tony Cryan Orchestra and the CJCS Orchestra. And, uh, you know, I've got three generations of music family in, in that little town. 
and and that town really like my you know although Woodstock and the Woodstock music scene was a big influence and all those Woodstock hippies and musicians from the band and and the Hawks and 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 Joplin's band uh well they'd all come through Stratford they'd all come through my father's backroom studio at the house and and uh I got to play Levon Helm's kit growing up when they were at the <laughs> Stratford Festival, you know, during sound check. And, and uh, I was just surrounded by, you know, King Biscuit Boy, who played harmonica for Muddy Waters and, and you know, just some of the great uh, Canadian musicians and world musicians and Woodstock musicians um, all in my little hometown. And the music scene, even the local musicians, uh, you know, growing up were, were really kind of world-class, even the ones that didn't make it out, you know, Mm -hmm. um, like such a vibrant, incredible music scene in that little town in the seventies and eighties, there were like four clubs or five clubs in town that would have, um, you know, bands five, six nights a week. Uh, they would, um, have traveling bands from everywhere from Detroit and Chicago playing in town to, uh, to all across Canada. And I'd go in for the matinees, you know, they'd serve food and I'd be an underage kid and I could get up on stage and sit in with Mac guitar Murphy from Aretha Franklin's band. And that's Jack amazing. Kaiser. And, uh, and I could sit in and, and play during the matinees and jam with all of these incredible musicians. That scene doesn't exist anymore, but even our little small town, definitely had a bunch of that hmm. you, you you know matt just passed i don't know if you know that no i didn't yeah he just passed uh, like uh, three to four weeks ago down in somewhere here i'm in tampa i think he was on the east coast of florida yeah 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 wow what a loss man yeah and, yeah I, and i mean i j- i got to jam with him when i was 14 years old like what what an experience yeah that's amazing did, did um do you know Red Volkart? Uh, I certainly know of Red, and, and unfortunately, I don't know Red, but I'm just such a fan, you know. He had a hell of a story, but, you know, he was grew up in Canada as well, so I just, you know, you know I'm like a, a typical ignorant American. I think every Canadian knows one another, you know. <laughs> well, I do, eventually. I, bet you I, I will run into Red and, and, and shake his hand at some point. Yeah, it's like my wife is from the UK, and people are always like, oh, we met some friends over there. Do you know? <laughs> Well, there's a double-sided joke in Nashville that I have with one of my engineer friends from New York, and he always says, like, um, hey, I met Mike the other day from Canada, you know, I wonder if you guys know each other. And I said, you know, the likelihood, honestly, is about 98% I do know him. Because <laughs> if he's in Nashville, he's in the music industry, and I think I do, at some point, we all actually kind of know each other, you know. it's yeah. um, uh, I, I keep running into Canadians that are, you know, established in America that come through Nashville. And then we finally end up working together and have known about each other for, you know, uh, ages, you know, well, man, I hope you get to work with red. He's a wonderful, lovely yeah. guy. Really. I mean, he's as good as his playing is, that's as much of a quality person as he is. What was your, what was your childhood like growing up? It sounds like it was like just packed with music 24 seven. That's what it was. There was yeah. music at my grandparents. There was music around the kitchen table. There was music in the back room of my house. There was music at the clubs that I was allowed to go to because my dad was a musician. And I mean, he'd take me on stage and set me on his amp. I'd dangle my feet off his amp when I was a little five, six, seven year old kid and get to watch John Till play, you know, who, from Janis Joplin's band. He was the guy who did that solo, the opening solo on uh, S- Summertime, wasn't he? Yeah, John was on Summertime and and uh, Bobby McGee. He was on the Pearl record. Yeah, what a he's a great because I remember I I you know he he's passed, but I I went to look. I think no, he's, John's still with us. I have to check him out. Okay, I, I no, John uh, John's still around. Okay, I got to look <laughs> into because I, I the guy who did that solo I thought passed, so I'm going to look. Oh uh, well, you know him. maybe that was the original uh, C- uh, Cosmic Blues Band guy. Yeah, I think it was because that yeah, was yeah, a hell yeah. of a solo. No, I wanted to. Yeah. Well, Janice always had a great band, and and so Albert Grossman, you know, uh, put a, a final band together for Janice, and and they were making the Pearl record, that literally while she passed away, while they were in the studio, they were in on Sunset Sound, 
waiting for her to come in to sing that day. And, and that's when they, they found her. So that's the last record with Bobby McGee and Mercedes Benz. And, um, and that's the record that, you know, that John was in and, and touring with. And he was on the Dick Cavett show with her. And there's all, all kinds of, you know, really great footage. He played Woodstock with her. And, um, you know, he was our local hometown. He's a Stratford, Ontario. He was uh, in the Revels with Richard Manuel and my dad. And they became the Hawks. And, you know, such a great, rich history. But John is, you know, a great rock and roll innovator and another under the radar guy that influenced a lot of people, man. I mean, Robbie Robertson was a roadie, you know, uh, for the Hawks, you know, watching John Till play. R Robbie might not admit that, <laughs> <laughs> but everybody else does, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, that whole scene was like this really cool thing. And John, John was definitely king of it, man. And, and he's got such a, a way of playing. And, you know, I feel like I, I need to definitely get back and, and make some music with John while I have the chance, you know, and, and, and try to capture some of his guitar stylings in the studio properly. He hasn't really, you know, um, his instrumentals, the way he plays them, haven't really been recorded or captured in the studio. And, and he does versions of Hideaway and, and a couple of songs that are, are just his own take on guitar playing that are just so unique and influential. Definitely, absolutely the largest guitar influence like the, uh, as, a, as a person in the room uh, that I ever had. You know? John Till, I'm going to look him up, man. Yeah. Let me ask you this, David. What are some of the bigger obstacles that you've had to overcome throughout like your musical journey, either music related, business related, personally, and uh, it's starting over so many times, I'm sure there was more than one. And that's my answer is, you know, starting over in mm -hmm. and of itself sucks. It's, it's, it's not, you know, to establish yourself to be in an area where everybody, you know, you've garnered the respect from doing the work. And, and, and so you get to this place where, you getting to reap some of the rewards and, and you've earned your earns enough stripes to have new work come in and new opportunities to pick up and move to a new music scene where nobody knows who you are or anything you've done. Um, literally over and over and over again. You know, I think I reinvented myself and completely picked up and moved about four times before I found Nashville and really planted an anchor here. And that was primarily to, to pursue a, an opportunity each time. Um, an opportunity brought me there. He's usually a band I was playing in that wanted to be based out of somewhere else, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was in a road band that left Ontario and kind of hubbed out of Calgary. And I was living in a, in a relationship and my girlfriend, uh, you know, her, her dad, uh, lived in Calgary. So we had a free basement to crash in and that, and that was home for a while, you know? And, uh, and then, um, you know, it was, uh, it was sort of like that. And then I got a, you know, an opportunity to play guitar in a label act with a, ro you know, a legitimate road band that was based out of Vancouver. So I picked up and, and left the Calgary music scene and went out and lived in Vancouver for a while. And, um, you know, I kind of up until, you know, up until Nashville, I made Nashville happen for myself. Like I came here and brought my own work here up until then I had been led and relatively unhappy. Again, it's kind of that, uh, goes back to that same old story of of really knowing that you're building something for yourself rather than just trying to fit in somewhere. Yeah. If, if having gone through all this, if you could go back and give advice to to younger David Kalmuski, assuming you'd have been open to listening, what advice would you have wanted to give yourself that would have helped you? Take better care of yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like just, you know, don't be an asshole. Uh, you know, be kind. And, you know, it, it's like I feel like I started out cocky and arrogant and then I earned some stripes and, and got open to learning from people. And now I'm so overwhelmed and blown away by 20 year olds that are teaching me shit every day, you know, and. I know they may walk into the room wide eyed and look up to me because of some credentials or some some uh, uh, things that they're aware of. But, man, I, I'm more blown away by them. Honestly, they're just walking in expecting something out of out of nostalgia to a certain extent. But what we create in the room in the moment, I can learn from anybody. You know, I got to record, you know, a six or seven year old uh, 
Maisie from, you know, Lennon and Maisie from, you know, uh, from the Nashville TV show. She's seven years old and sings like Nora Jones, <laughs> you know, like, oh my God. like so gifted beyond, uh, you know, comprehension at some points, you know, and, and, I, and I've gotten to be in the room with Vince Gill and Journey and, and, and Keith Urban and, and, you know, um, Greg Wells, the producer from LA is actually a fellow Canadian, literally the most talented human being I've ever met in my life i mean he is a so gifted as an instrumentalist he's laid one of the coolest most exciting vibrant drum tracks i think i've witnessed uh and then goes over to the piano and kind of does the same thing you know and and it's um so many gifted people and to just i'm still a sponge man i don't um i think i used to um you know, going back to the advice thing is, is I used to try to, uh, you know, be seem, le- not seem less impressed. I used to just kind of try to bulldoze my ideas across a room because I wanted to be important or, or establish myself or, or I thought that's how you'd earn respect. And the moment I stopped caring about respect or earning anything and allowed myself to be swooned and blown away. Uh, that became the norm, and that's how I live every day. I, I just I, I learn from so many people. I, I I have access to the most gifted people on the planet, uh, and again, that doesn't go that doesn't go missing on me. That's awesome. Uh, by any stretch, I'm I'm a sponge, man. I don't um, I take it all in, and I learn from everybody that I, I I'm surrounded by. That's really cool of you that you recognize that about yourself too. I think. All righty, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. What's your go-to guitar right now, and what other two guitars of yours would round out your top three? Uh, oh, that's hard. Man. <laughs> I know. You know, I should have been prepared for that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have too many guitars. That means. Well, you know, actually, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it that way. I, I meant it more like you know, like I'll listen to a song first and and really think about what the you know what the song needs. And sometimes it's a plinky little jazz master with a, you know, a, a Vibrolux with the reverb cranked up and some tremolo. And then, you know, the chorus might need a Les Paul with a plexi, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, um, I really, I'm the guy that just kind of, when I was touring, I, you know, I, I played Telecasters a lot right. out on stage and I, and interestingly enough, I don't record with Telecasters very much. I record a, a, a lot with, Gibsons and Gretches and and really odd guitars, you know, um, some of the the uh, silver tone reissues and a couple of Supro guitars and just you know yeah I love those silver tones yeah 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 and then you know the uh, harmony guitars and things oh, so so I had to pick one I always seem to want to play my uh, fifty nine Gretsch double anniversary you know mint green guitar. Um, that's yeah. a that's a horrible guitar to have to play i'm sure <laughs> yeah it's uh there's just something about awesome, it there's in that thing it just kind of it's it's rickety and 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 fun it's a fun guitar to play that's more from you know my personal enjoyment and then two other guitars i mean if i just had to like go across town unannounced with a couple of guitars to play on a session i'd probably uh you know take a my 345 i've got a 1962 345 wow that's a beautiful guitar um, man and then i got a uh my gretch which i would take and then uh, you know i take something fender so probably one of the telecasters do you have any of your dad's guitars yeah i do i've got a 62 jazz and i got a 59 telecaster of his those must be like really cool like nostalgic when you pick them up i guess they're really great and and everybody loves his bass, I mean, everybody from Michael Rhodes to Pino Palladino to John Diamond, like that, his bass gets put on records on a weekly basis. It's on the <laughs> Keith Urban record. Greg Wells played it, and, and Keith actually played my dad's old Telecaster. And, and so, wow. you know, it, it is a conversation piece. Out of all the guitars at the studio, it kind of gets passed around and talked about. Uh, and the history of that guitar and, and you know, John Till from Janis Joplin's band kind of borrowed it for several years and, and played it. And, uh, you know, everybody from um, 
there's a story about Bob Dylan, you know, strumming it backstage and just everybody talking about the, you know, the places that guitar has been even just sitting in the corner of the room witnessing, uh, is pretty cool. That's very cool, man. What a nice, uh, it's good that you have that, man. It's good, good, you know, good mojo in there, man. Yeah. Um, name a couple of players that you've really enjoyed working with and maybe one or two you'd like working with, and you could pick whatever you want, whether you've worked with them playing, touring, or producing. Um, okay, and this also is going to sound like a cop-out. It's kind of like the guitar question. Um, the thing about moving to Nashville is I could call what I consider historically and musically one of the greatest drummers in the world – one of the greatest bass players in the world, one of the the greatest piano players in the world, put myself out on guitar on the chair and then call one of the other greatest guitar players in the world so that I could, I actually get to, to, you know, play with them. And, and it's, and I'm, and I'd be sitting there going, this is the greatest band in the, in the world. These are all of my, you know, uh, before I moved to town, I, I knew all of these names. I, kn- I knew these players. Now they're my friends. And and the funny bit is that could be a Monday, and I could repeat the same thing Tuesday, and it's a completely different group of players. And I complete the same thing Thursday. Like, I'm, I'm friends with 10 of the greatest drummers in the world. I get to record... You know, um, Greg Morrow and Chad Cromwell and Steve Jordan and, 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 and like, you know, down the list, everybody from near Z and Shannon Forrest. And it's like, I'm not picking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no, I'm not picking. There's no way. There's just so many guys. I feel actually horrible that I've just named like six of them because there's. Yeah, I, I get it. So many more, man. Miles McPherson. And, and like, I actually got to stop naming it now. And I won't do that to my bass player friends and my guitar player friends, <laughs> my keyboard player friends, like right. dozens of my biggest influences and my greatest friends and the greatest musicians I've ever worked with. And it's why I moved to Nashville. Yeah. Uh, it's why I never left. I didn't really plan on moving to Nashville. You know, I mean, I was popping my head in town to, to make records kind of as a hub to, to tour from and, and look for a few opportunities but that musician community alone, just getting to participate in that, it became really evident to me after like two or three sessions that I could never leave here. And I mean, they were demo sessions and I'm sitting across the room with some of the greatest talent I've ever played with. Yeah. It's funny. I was talking to a guy in the UK and he said, um, I, f- I forgot Bonnie Tyler, I think is the person he plays yeah. with. And, um, he said they Bonnie made the record in Nashville, and the guitar players were Kenny Greenberg, Jerry McPherson, yeah. and Tom Bukovac. And I'm like, only in Nashville. That's, that's, that's just course, an average absolutely. like Tuesday, like you're saying. And I'm like, well, and 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 the funny bit is that's exactly. I mean, I I put uh, I put uh, Jerry and and Tom Tom and Jerry. <laughs> 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 together all, all the time you know yeah. i mean we just did jonathan kane's solo record with those two guys and and i'll put myself out on the floor with bukovac or i'll put bukovac out there with uh you know pat buchanan or it'll be me and pat or me and tom or or you know what i mean yeah. it's just like uh and jeff king and just like yeah. I, again i gotta shut up because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's at cornfloss and like there's just so many of my favorite guitar players in the world and and the great bit is that we're all trading pedals and guitar i got you know i got 10 things in this room from bukovac i've got two things or three things from from buchanan we're all we all trade pedals and guitars and and actually you know um swap stuff out and talk gear and and geek out yeah uh with the entire community and I just want to say to the listeners, you mentioned two guys, uh, three guys, Pat Buchanan, Jeff King, and Jerry McPherson. I interviewed all three of those guys. They're wonderful people if you want to go oh, listen yeah, to those man. interviews. Check, check them out. Yeah, yeah. Really, really cool guys, all three of them. What, Th- what did you get into with Pat? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, that was uh, – that, <laughs> that God, I love that guy, man. It was and like, like Pat- hurting cats a little bit. Oh, totally. Well, you know, imagine being on a session with these guys too. Like between tunes, I said it's it's sort of like 
the most attention deficit children they could ever, you know, you could ever imagine because the moment the track stops, everybody's like playing Led Zeppelin songs. Some guys are wandering out in the lobby playing the jukebox. Mm. The other guys on their phone. It's just sort of like, you know. I, uh, I will tell you that Jerry, Jeff got really deep personally and Jerry um, got really deep as far as career in the music business. It was a, both of those guys were really great interviews and I, and I've since seen them since the first, I first, I, I got to meet them in Nashville. One time when I came up, I was out and Jerry came out to, to hang and awesome. really cool. And then uh, this is real funny. Um, my wife, is a Reba fan. So Jeff was coming to town and I said, Hey Jeff, you got some time to hang. And he goes, you know, just, he goes for a little bit. Yeah. Before the show, because you want some tickets. And I said, yeah, that'd be real sweet of you. So he gave us tickets and, um, we had like VIP passes and I, I don't get pictures taken with people, but my wife wanted to get a picture with Reba. So we're waiting on her. We were waiting online and all of a sudden it was like really weird. I'm not a big guy. I'm only five, nine. And I feel this like, giant presence and i turn around and, and jeff king had been standing next to us oh yeah jeff's a big, big yeah, dude yeah and he's like a practical <laughs> joker so he had been standing next to us for like five minutes like like just listening yeah, to our- he's a funny dude man <laughs> yeah he, he'll just prank you and and that's he's just wonderful he's great you know, Re- the, real just, good guy yeah you know you think about somebody like jeff and you look at his resume and his career and you know you move to town as a young unknown producer and then you hire Jeff King and you're nervous. You think, oh, sure. you know, this ma- this massive ego is about to show up here. You know, you'd assume, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and you know, th- th- on your first session, these guys end up pranking you, and it's just, you know, that's Nashville. It really is just uh, a community, and there's a lot of mutual respect. You got to hold your own. I don't think that you'd get that if you were, you know. Um, if you sucked, yeah. Horrible, you know, <laughs> and, and and trying to undercut people and make them play on crappy demos as your first, you know, introduction in town. You got to, you know, you know, you got to wait till everybody likes it before you impose that on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I, I mean, I think, but you're right. It's an incredibly, it's just the community is very, very supportive and it's a warm, you know, you don't, look, I'm not in there with you guys, but I know everybody I've dealt with has been, even just of me. Yeah. I mean, just incredibly supportive, man. So, you know what I've never heard in any of these guys is any of them say about each other, like, uh, or roll their eyes yeah. or be negative. You know, like nobody is like, it's not competitive to the point where someone undercuts someone else's playing or abilities. Nobody said ever amongst any of those guys, oh, that guy sucks. Yes, and, and we. But I mean, like, absolutely. once you get into that rung and you've proven yourself, and you're actually a great musician, you're in. Like you're with everyone else as far as the the level of respect, and it's that's never undermined. And and I can't say the same thing about L.A. or New York or a lot of the other markets that I've worked in and and tried to live in before Nashville. It's um, Nashville's like a unicorn, man. It is the it's it truly is. not competitive. And that is uh, certainly not amongst the songwriter community, <laughs> uh, but, but definitely amongst the musicians and the engineers and the and the studio people and and uh, you know for the most part it's it's uh, on this side of the glass. Um, the it, you know it's a competitive music industry. You want to yeah. get the call to play on on the records, if especially if you're sitting around. But if you don't get the call, you're not immediately throwing whoever got the call under the bus or, or trying to undermine them or trying to talk people out of using other people. It's sort of like, you know, if, so, if somebody decides to use someone that you would see as a competitor, the only reaction I've ever seen out of that is, Oh, they're amazing. That's yes. Great. Can't wait to hear it. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, and I talk to guys off camera yeah, off the record. Yeah. And, and I've never heard that either. No, I've only, don't. yeah, never. It just doesn't exist. It's a real cool place, man. So I have another question for best, but this one you should be able to answer because you won't offend anybody or <laughs> yeah. three top three desert island discs in no particular order just for today. Cause obviously wow. this will change every day. Probably houses of the holy. That's awesome. I have not heard that one yet. That's cool, Syn- man. Synchronicity. 
Another great album, man. And Soul Cages. What's Soul Cages? Who's that? That's a Sting solo record that he apologized for years. Like that thing came out and he was like, I'm really sorry. I lost my father. And I was like going through some deep personal stuff. And it's like, I'm really sorry about that record. And, and that to me was like the deepest record. I didn't like the singles. I didn't like the two up tempo songs, but I loved the soundscapes and the playing and the, and just, I love that record. I, I, you know, I, I haven't listened to it in years, but I actually revisited it a couple of years ago. I thought, man, I'm on a long drive. I'm just going to download soul cages and go for a ride. And I was not disappointed. And it's like, when I visit some records I was into when I was a kid or youth, it's it's about 50-50. Sometimes it's almost embarrassing to listen to. It's like, oh, wow, I thought this was great. And then other times it's like, oh, yeah, no, this holds up. Um, Soul Cages is still, man, that's just a work of art for me. I'm going to have to check that out. I've never heard that record. What's the, David, what's the most important things you've learned about yourself through your career experience and life in general? Um, that the only valuable, precious commodity is time. Yeah, I hear that. I you don't feel it when you, you don't feel it when you're younger, you know, you think it's money or you think it's popularity or you think it's other people's, um, opinion or value of you, but it's not, man, it's, it's time because the people who value you, you can't control any of that. Right. People think they can. They try hard. They modify their behavior. They, uh, I don't know, they just go down different paths trying to impress people. And once you knock all that stuff off, it, the funny bit is the moment you stop trying and really adhere to who you are, you start collecting people that love what you do and who yeah. you are really individually. And it's not a facade you have to keep up. You just have to be yourself. Once you get through that phase, which I think most people go through in their 20s, once you land in your 30s, you actually start collecting people. Yeah. I agree real people, like real friends and real colleagues that you get to trudge through life with, mm. through the ups and downs that aren't, you know, with you because of your popularity or, or uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I find it difficult to make real new friends because of maybe the status that I have, you know, and people will... Um, maybe look at the situation I'm in or a, or a record that I did that's successful or the things around me and figure I'm important and popular, but that gets masked as, as being emotionally connected to someone, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, you know <laughs> it's like this weird thing. Yeah. So I mean, honestly, a lot of the really great friends I have that are lifers are, are, you know, people that I kind of moved to town with and couch surf with. And we're interestingly enough, they're all really successful too. Like, uh, I, you know, lots of people, not that I'm really successful at all. I didn't mean to put myself in any, any kind of situation. I just mean that we all came up and, and kept our heads down and, and just made, made us stay for ourselves. And a few people have infiltrated our group over time, but, um, but they also, the, a lot of them have left too, you know? I mean, it, artists in general, um, it's their job to be disloyal. Yeah. And, and and that's a sad, it's kind of a sad thing because while you're working with an artist, you be you break bread, you share life stories, you laugh, you cry, you really have this deep connection, you mix great music. But if an opportunity with bigger management and a bigger label or a move to the West coast or a move somewhere else, uh, is offered. I, I'm not even holding an artist responsible. It's their job. They have to, they, they, they have to preserve their biggest opportunity. And I don't know a single artist that really hasn't, you know, dropped their early manager from their early career or, the first four producers they worked with or, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it, and it's really hard to work in an industry where your, your friends, there's always that group of friends that are, um, there for, you know, for a while, but you ne you don't hold anybody responsible to that. And I think it's actually the artists themselves when they drop and move on that feel probably so guilty about it, uh, that they disconnect, you know, out of, 
out of things. So, you know, again, I know this is a kind of a long rambling thing about what no, I've learned. T- totally cool. Um, but what I've learned about myself is that, um, you know, don't let anybody else put, um, don't let anybody else discredit the work and don't put any responsibility on anyone for loyalty. There's really no such thing as loyalty. And if you're counting on it, you'll go through life jaded and heartbroken. You know, um, just be as connected as you can to the people that are in your life at that current time. Don't put any expectations on them and make great art, make music, uh, live your life now. I, I mean, who knows what the end date is for any of us, yeah. you know? And so, um, if you're harboring expectations out of the people you're working with for some kind of reciprocal loyalty, that actually does not exist at any level in the music industry. And, and there's so many people that would say to me, that's not true. You know, here's an example. I've been with so-and-so for 23 years. I'm talking about the people before the so-and-so, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, or whatever. I mean, there's this rung of, of people who are on a trajectory on their way up. I had to leave my home country. I had to move across to the West coast. I had to quit bands. I had to do all kinds of stuff too. Uh, before I was established enough to be secure in any market I lived in. That's the perpetual life of an artist the entire time of their career. I've actually been that person and I didn't treat it like this loyalty. It's self-preservation and it's, it's giving yourself the opportunity to um, to be in the biggest opportunity available to you. So you're just super mature about, you know, this isn't a personal thing. People are moving up, bottom line. People are doing what they have to do, and it's not about me. It's about what they want to do. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, it's interesting. But by the same token, I'm not saying I'm, uh, you know, a philanthropist of loyalty, but I've been the guy that has been approached by management and a label and artist to produce someone and when I investigate their material, it's fantastic. And the recordings they've already done are really amazing. And I'll be the first one to, to go back at, at that, the team and say, why wouldn't you release this material? Or offer to co-produce with the existing team if the, if the people involved just didn't have the name. Because it's like, it's such a sad thing. I, I've certainly been punted for a bigger name more than chosen because of my name. Hmm. Uh, but I have this conversation with some of the biggest producers in the world. This is common. This is why I say what I said earlier, where is this, this myth of loyalty doesn't exist. It's, it happens all the way up and down the ladder. So you'll have a young struggling producer think if I could only be so-and-so because they're established and they get all the calls, those people get punted all the time for somebody more interesting or important. That's cool that you're sharing that because I think a lot of people listening to that will feel a lot better when they when they hear that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny you mentioned time. I've always told my kids, I said, you know, you can always make more money. You cannot make time. I agree with you 100%. That is the scarce commodity, man. Yeah. This is a tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. I think that artists are pretty self-loathing. Um, somebody, I asked somebody, I asked Adam Zimmon that question. I don't know if you know him. He's a guitar player. He plays with Ziggy Marley. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I asked him that question. He goes, how can I answer that question? I have so much self-loathing. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I kind of, you know, if we're really being honest, yeah. it's the crux of it. Um. I like my ability to mentor, help and include people. You know, I think I like the fact that I really do use my ears and my, my, I'm so unfazed and uninterested in status, popularity or previous success. It really is about personality, people in the room and making music. I've learned from, 14 year olds I've worked with. I've learned from 70 year olds I've worked with. If I'm in the room, I'm completely oblivious to anything other than what we're creating. And I'm so excited about it, whether it's an indie project that's just starting out that the world doesn't know, or whether it's a triple A list superstar. It, it, it literally makes zero difference to me. There's no, there's no difference in the adrenaline. 
That's awesome. And man. I know that's a that's a gift, man. I, I you know it's it's allowed me to navigate kind of in the sidelines and and have sustainability through what's a, a long career that I hope is you know somewhere in the middle. Hmm. You're also you to me. You come across like, like you've got good survival skills. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I that must. I mean, that must. Be I something. am so compelled to do this that it's. Um, I don't need much, you know. Honestly, I didn't come from a tremendous amount as far as luxury and and money and 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 all of that stuff. I came from people, hmm. you know. Like I came from a family that was that w- had to work hard and and. And I always thought had really nice things and a really nice upbringing and considering, you know, a single mom with a, a, you know, a pretty low income uh, growing up and a musician dad, you know, um, there weren't doctors and lawyers. There wasn't millions of dollars and, and brand new cars in the driveway every year. So that stuff doesn't mean anything to me Hmm. at all. Uh, it's sitting around a kitchen table, connecting with people, it's conversations. It's, um, that's all I've known in my life. So when I have a little bit of money and I have a little bit of, um, sustainability, I I may invest a, a little bit in some of those things, but I just invest in the things that allow me to continue more of that which is building a studio and 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 getting the even more equipment and the things and the toys that I want to do things that I think are incredible and then I think that that's infectious and then that compulsion when I work with an artist gets really inspired and it's this cyclic thing you know I invest honestly in people it's always been about the hang I I tell even the interns and and people that come through the studio they they get so focused on their priority list and I tell them you know, the candles and paper towels are, are literally just as important as the U47 and the, and the vocal compressor. You know, it's sort of like, we, this is all about vibe. Who doesn't have gear? If you're making records <laughs> in the music industry, there better be lots of gear around. Yeah. That's it. It's the people sitting in these chairs and the experience they can have together uh, that, that's just always been my focus. I'm, I feel really connected with the music I make and I feel really connected with the artists I make the music with. And I know Nashville can kind of get, I see a lot of people complaining on social media about the cookie cutter nature. And I just read a thread where somebody was complaining about, you know, there being no creativity in the workspace and expectations. And, and I'm like, uh, it's the complete opposite experience for me. I, I've never sacrificed that to just churn out something formulated to, adhere to the needs of uh whatever the latest testing and and trend is you know i don't make music for um for the common denominator of the billboard charts it, mm-hmm. it's it's never come into play what i do is get to know the life story of people and try to make music that uh i mean we make some duds along the way it's kind of you know everybody does but Man, the music that I've connected with, I'll listen to 10 years later and feel just as emotional as I did in the studio making it. And that, to me, just shows me that I'm, I'm doing something right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm creating the soundtrack of people's lives. All right, cool, Very man. Cool. Hey, what's your best childhood memory? Oh, you know, just sitting on stage with my father, dangling my feet off his bass amp, looking across the stage at John Till playing guitar. You know, I was so hypnotized and enamored by those dudes and music. And there was so much music around me. There was music everywhere. And, uh, man, getting to go to a gig with my dad, he'd just, like, pick me up and sit me right on his bass amp. And my legs would be dangling. They wouldn't touch the floor. And. I don't know. I was like four or five years old. I'd just sit the whole set right on his bass amp. You said that a few times, man. So I, I know. Oh, how, yeah. yeah, I know how, how I know easily it is your best childhood memory. Anything you're still interested in learning to do? Oh, too much, man. I'm just so overwhelmed by things that I, I want to know and get better at. 
that's part of the problem of being a little bit diverse. You know, I play a little drums and piano and, 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 you know, uh, weird instruments like mandocello and instruments tuned in fifths, but I'm not fluent, you know, the way I am on a, on a, on a guitar or the way I am at a mixing console. So I like, I want piano lessons. I want drum lessons. I want, um, to be a better, uh, machine and Ableton programmer, um, there's technology I want to be better at, uh, you know, I want to practice, you know, my sight reading and which is nil, like it's almost nothing. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I carry around this in my head, but, but I'm, you know, I'm too busy making music to, to get better at some of those other things, you know? Sure. It's always good to have that stuff though. It keeps you sort of, you know, driven or, yeah. You know. What are you proudest of, both musically and personally? Um, huh. You know, are, are they two separate things or one thing? Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like I don't, I just keep my head down. You know, I don't, I don't exercise pride. It, it, it sounds a little odd, but, um, I never really thought about it till I'm actually faced with that question. Um, and I mean, I'm proud in the moment. Like I, I have daily or, you know, daily exercise of pride. When I hear playback in the speakers of something that went really right or it's created, man, I'm, I am super proud in that moment. And that, and that isn't about me, um, getting, any kind of recognition or approval from anyone else that happens to me sitting alone in a room. The moment I come up with the perfect guitar part for a song or when a beat really lays in and feels great and I'm playing it and, and, or I hear a sound that I've created in the studio. Like I get so proud and excited um, about that on such a regular basis you know, I'm proud of the music I've made, I guess, you know, I, I mean, of the good music I've made, uh, both on a personal level and, and, and on a musical level. So I had a question here. I, I you may just say no. What, any hobbies or interests outside of music? Yeah. You know, I mean, electronics, which is kind of music, <laughs> you know, I guess. <laughs> that doesn't count. You know, I asked somebody that question one time. They said, "Yeah, guitars." <laughs> yeah, guitar. Yeah, exactly. I'm kind of that guy, unfortunately, man. I mean, I, you know, it's funny. I, I did fix up an old house over the last couple of years, so I like tinkering around. Like, oh, that's I, cool. My father was into woodworking and doing really cool things. You know, he's a very avid musician and audio engineer, and still found time to create these amazing glass-like finishes on old tables. You know, the antiques that he'd refinish. And he just loved it. He didn't do it for money or anything. He just like he'd give furniture to his friends, or he wasn't like selling pieces of furniture. He'd do it for himself. Um, and I feel like renoing a house was very. Um, and I mean, I had contractors doing most of the work, but I'd go over and actually like I I refinish the countertops myself, and I tinker around, and I'm building something cool over there. Like I like antique shopping, and and you know, oh, again, we talk about creating a vibe. And like, rather than this is a guest house for, for like musicians and artists and songwriters and friends that come to town. And so I know it's kind of has something to do with music, but it's more about the human connection and friends. Cause I do just have dinner parties over there and invite people over when it, when I don't have clients in town, but rather than just like have a place for them to crash, I put a four track reel to reel studio over there with some old microphones and a baby grand piano and it's hundred year old oak, uh, you know, hardwood floors that I had refinished. And this was a dilapidated crack house, uh, that was abandoned since the eighties. Awesome. So it was like, you know, the, the plaster ribbed walls and the ceiling had caved in. It was like, it was a complete unbelievable, you know, transformation. And, um, so now it's like looking for board games and putting a typewriter with some letterhead for people to write lyric sheets <laughs> on and, and love cool. letters to their friends with like, you know, uh, post stamped envelopes. Uh, so that you can, somebody can just sit down and type a letter to somebody they yeah. love and, uh, and a record collection, you know, and, and just having like a really cool place for artists to go. 
that's kind of my hobby is like create vibing out that house as as like a as like the coolest hang ever yeah man that sounds like a hotel room i want to stay in you know like yeah <laughs> very cool man hey i'm gonna ask you three more questions first one yeah. as somebody behind the board and a producer what's your favorite and least favorite part of your job favorite j- part of the job is definitely tracking like what do, you know what do you t- mean by that specifically Well, it's like taking the ideas that I created with the artist after listening to the demo or sitting with it acoustic and vocally and, you know, agreeing on a tempo and a vibe and really imagining the casting call of what musicians we want to play. Tracking day is when everybody shows up, when I've got six or seven musicians all hanging out in the room. We've got a food spread on. Everybody's, you know, imbibing in a glass of wine or whatever they like. Like, I don't track... When on a tracking date for me, it's not the typical Nashville, like three hour session that people roll into. And, and you, you know, I try again, it's vibe. I, I just try to have a day out of it. I, you know, we bring in an amazing food spread and uh, everyone's favorite adult beverage. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and we talk, like and, and we talk that. about the songs, you know, and we talk and, and we, the artist is usually singing live on a microphone and it's not sterilized and it's not like, okay, guys, we've got three hours and I want to get five songs. It's more like, hey, I'm happy if I get two. And if it goes so well, we'll throw a third on the pile or, or whatever. And we'll just book off a half a day. And, and I, I love that process, hearing it all come together in a moment's time. Usually the first time the band is doing their initial pass, it's like, you know, you know, like, this is so unbelievably amazing beyond my expectations, or this is far below my expectations and we need to make a change. Mm-hmm. I don't like piecemealing music together. I don't program a bunch of elements and then bring in one guy at a time and build it up to sit at the end and go, you know, I need to hear a band. I need to hear the symbiotic energy of everything. And I, I need to be able to change the, the overall approach instantly. Um, And that's really exciting to me. I I love being able to do that. Um, Some tracks that are more programmed heavy, like I do some extreme pop music that's a little bit more piecemeal. Uh, And and so that doesn't necessarily apply as far as a big band. But, man, I still make a lot of music with a big band, and that's kind of my favorite thing. That's wonderful. wonderful. So you're doing a lot of old school styles approach. Yeah, it's more hybrid. I mean, there's programmed elements. I mean, a lot of the keyboard players in town will – and guitar players will will be really creative with very pop and very progressive ideas and lots of really cool effects and and you know you can accomplish a lot more even if there's no real drums or there's a programmed element that, or the drummer just comes in on choruses it's still great to have a band you know i can get back here and if it became too organic i can mute away things but i can also have a, an extremely progressively programmed production uh and tuck a real band in on the choruses and the, and the real drums in. And it just gives it that extra amazing lift that I feel like some of some people that don't take it that extra step don't really get, you know, if they open and close it in the box, you know, it's, it's sort of like, it's the luxury and why we come to a place like this or why we built a place like this is to be able to give the song its absolute best no matter what it's just about the song getting its best treatment sometimes i i like i said i'll leave it completely in the box because that's exactly what the song needs but we gotta try if this if you know it's like there are no limitations if you have something like this yeah two drum kits set up and a and a fazioli grand piano seven synthesizers four guitar rigs an ampeg uh bass rig uh, you know from the 60s you know 60 guitars on site everything is available for us to give the song i'm not limited i'm not like well you know this is as good as i can get it with this set of tools it's sort of like man if this thing needs a sitar i'll go on craigslist and buy one or i'll audition the the five best sitar samples and and see if that cuts it you know but uh that's kind of the philosophy is is like i don't i don't have a method i don't have like a well here's my five guys that i use if i'm doing the old school thing or here's my template to use to create um i really 
feel like I listen to each song and each artist and try to create a really unique casting call and vibe around them and around their vibe. Very cool. What's your least favorite part of sitting behind the board? Um, technical things, you know, like uh, fixing gear, which I, you know, I, I have a, a couple of great texts and stuff. But like when things go down, I don't like editing um, and like Pro Tools, I, I'm not a big fan of, but I'm more efficient at it than most people uh, just because I'm that guy. Um and I've, and you know, I always remain pretty cutting edge, man. I, I've, I'm always updated. I've always got, you know, relatively the newest system, and I spend a tremendous amount of time learning uh, machine and Ableton and technology and Melodyne and Pro Tools and 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 keeping up on every new update and every new keyboard command and every new shortcut. Um, and I don't like it. <laughs> no, I totally but get I, that because but it's. I like- but I like once I've absorbed it, once it becomes yeah. muscle memory, and once I it becomes sort of a powerful set of tools that is a language for me to be able to, to work in a system to modify the music the way I want. Uh, I like the outcome of it, but I don't. I don't like. It's always daunting to me when there's a major update and there's an entire new feature set. Uh, I'm not a guy that's like, oh, I don't need that. Even if they take something away from us that. I go, oh, you know, I throw a tantrum for about a half an hour and go, why would they take that away? I use that every day. Then I just learn the new way and and move forward. It's amazing how much time is involved in doing what you do. I mean, you're responsible for a lot of moving parts, much more than I was aware of, frankly. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. Anything you wish you've done differently? No. No regrets, man. You know, I had a wild childhood, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and yeah, man, I, I, I learned a lot of life's lessons. There's a lot of loss and there's a lot of things. And, you know, we all wish we were immortal and we all wish that our parents had never die and all of that crazy stuff. But that's just not, I can just live in a fantasy world. Um, you know, I'm sitting here. Today's a gift, yeah. you know, and I'm, I am who I am and I react to the world the way I do because of all of the good and bad things that have happened to me collectively. Agree with you, man. Every day is a gift and I feel the same. Last question, man. And I really appreciate all your time. Thank you for everything. Yeah, no worries. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change was intentional or deliberate and how much was just a function of aging? Um, I think I've become a little more patient. I'm pretty impatient. Uh, I think I've become more kind, you know, I, I, I think that the youthful arrogance of me in my twenties into my thirties, um, dissipated and was humbled by Nashville pretty quickly. You know, I, I was operating in a lot, I, you know, I, I was kind of, you know, I was kind of a know-it-all, um, outwardly. And now it's like, I, I'm humbled. I want to know everything. I have a tremendous amount of knowledge and I have a lot of pride in the knowledge I have. I'm, I'm a bit of an internal know-it-all, but I do it silently and I let the work speak for itself. And I let my ability sort of just shine through with, with the wisdom and the knowledge I have. I don't, I don't use it as a, um, as a mechanism to, compete or put myself up against other people. Again, Nashville's really non-competitive and that taught me a lot. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I'm still impatient at, you know, and I, and I have a low tolerance for ignorance or other people that are, you know, ignorant sort of pushing around, you know, um, bullshit. But, um, I think that's it. I think just patience and kindness and, um, and a little bit of silence, just not not ta- not talking shit, not talking about stuff, just doing it and learning it and knowing it. And then if it comes up and if somebody needs a little help or someone wants an opinion on something, they, they might even be surprised by the vat of knowledge that may come out um, in, in a certain subject where they didn't really know I was knowledgeable. 
Man, I can't thank you enough. Thanks for uh, being so straightforward and sharing everything. Um, people could find you online. It's David Kalmuski, and you could, he's got a great website, actually. It's kalmuski.com. I'll spell that for you. K-A-L-M-U-S-K-Y.com. And it, like, what if, what if someone's interested in like talking to you about production? Is there a contact form on your site or doing some work with them? Yeah, there's a contact form on my site. I'm on social media. Instagram is slash Cal Muskie. Facebook is slash Cal Muskie. Twitter is slash Cal Muskie. Um, you know, our site, Addiction Sound Studios, you can Google that. There's a contact form there that goes to my, my engineering staff. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm pretty accessible, man. I, I mean, I do listen to some things and, and uh, I can't listen to everything. And I do have a business manager that kind of uh, keeps me in line and scolds me for uh, <laughs> getting, getting too involved in, in uh, you know, in things. But I'm not, I'm not going to like, you know, um, necessarily listen to everything and and, uh, and give advice on things. Uh, it's not a lot of time for that. No, but, that's, yeah. Um, but if you're a Nashville music maker and, and you're inspired by anything I've done and you got some links and stuff I, I just i love hearing new music and meeting new artists you know so uh reach out um add me on insta and and uh and you know send me some music through uh through the website very cool man thanks david i appreciate everything hold on we'll wrap up everybody thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed this interview please share it with a friend on your social media channels we definitely appreciate your support and thanks again to david kalmuski for spending time with us i really appreciate it man thanks yeah that's been fun make sure you go to the home page of everyonelovesguitar.com sign up to get on our newsletter list and get advance notice of guests coming on the show and the opportunity to ask your own questions and most important remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.